Yeah, okay. Um, so today we gonna we're going to continue with the um, with the Shushal Yams, uh, song of the day, and today we're going on to Sunday's um, song of the day, which is Chaf Dalet or twenty four. If you're following, um, if you're following in the text, um, and so in this in this um, chapter of um, of Tehillim, um, it was this which we say every every Sunday at the end of our davening. Um, this was composed by David Hamelach on the day that he bought the land from uh, the land of the from um, Har Habayit, place where the temple was built from the Yavusi people, and he intended for this song to be sung um, at the inauguration of the um, of the um, Beis Hamikdash. Um, which didn't happen in his time, obviously, in the time of Shlomo, and also will be sung at the inauguration of our Beit HaMikdash, please God. Um, it was also sung by David um, when he brought the Aaron, the Ark, into the, um, into the Kaddish Kaddash, and up to Yerushalayim, wasn't the Kaddish Kaddashim yet. Um, it says that this capital of Tehillim reminds us all the time of our obligations to use the world and make a Kiddush Hashem with our use of the world. Um, so let's have a look. Um, let's have a look at the capital itself. And it begins with the words, Le David Mizmo La Hashem to David, a song, um, the land is God's and everything and, and everything that fills it, Tevel the Yoshve um, Va, um, and all those who dwell, um, who dwell in it as well. Um, so, if you remember last week, where, the, where we learned the capital to Hillam that began with the words Shir Mizmor, and we discussed the difference between a Mizmor and a Shir, and how a Mizmor is a song without words generally. Um, mizmor is, a, is an emotion, whereas Shir is a song that's already expressing the emotion. And so, to have this concept of Le David Mizmor means that David was already filled with this emotion. He didn't, so sometimes. The song, the capital of Tehillim, um, is it, it's preceded by um, first there's Ruach Hakodesh and there's emotion that goes on and whatever, and then only the song, the Tehillim, is able to come out. And sometimes um, the person already has these feelings in them and they're able to um, to say them or feel them right away. So when we see David's name first, Le David, he was already in this very high space, in this amazing ability to um, express his, his wonderment at the greatness of Hashem, Mizmar, and so Le David, at that very high space that he was in, Mizmor, he was able to sing, he was able to um, show his emotions, he was able to um, put them into a capital, a chapter of Tehillim, which, um, which he would compose. And what, is, what does he say? He says, La Hashem Haaretz Umala. The land, the earth, um, and whatever is in it belongs to Hashem. Tevel the Yesh Veva, everything, all those who inhabit the land. This is all. This is all God's. So this is his proclamation. Every everything is um, everything is Hashem's. La Hashem So the Medrash um, explains this with a little marshal, and the Medrash says that um, normally when you have an owner of a boat, he rents space on the boat to pe for people to use for cargo or for whatever else, and that's his, so he owns the boat, but the cargo and the boat is not his. Um, with Hashem, he owns the world. And the cargo in the world, okay, everything that's in the world is also Hashem's, okay, different to a regular, um, different to a regular owner. Explains so that explains an understanding the Hashem Haaretz, the world belongs to Hashem, Umaloya, and everything that fills it. Okay, so the land, the world is Hashem's, the universe is Hashem, actually, but here it just says the land is Hashem's, Umaloya, and everything that fills it is also Hashem's. Another way of understanding this, according to the to the Medrash is if a man owns a building and the building is five amos high, five meters high, but the man is only three meters high, he still owns the whole building, but he doesn't fill the whole building. And the greatness of Hashem is he owns the whole world and he fills the whole world, right? He is, he is the, um, the whole world. Um, and this is the glory of Hashem. He owns the world, he fills the world, it is his world, and he lets us um, live in it. Um, the glory yeah. 
Um, we actually write this pasuk in our in our yes. safers in the I'm front. Going to, I'm going to yeah. explain that as we go. Yes. Um, so so uh, the Gemara says that from here we learn that all physic, physical things, all contents of the world have holiness. Um, if if it belongs to Hashem, it's holy. Um, and um, and and. It, if we realize that, if we stop for a minute and we realize that, um, we treat the world, um, we treat the world um, completely, completely differently. I'm learning in Chumash with my grade 11s about how Yaakov went back, and as Rashi says, he went back for pachim katanim, which means for little vessels. So he had moved his whole family over the river, and he turned around and he went back to get those little vessels. And we all wonder about it. Like, um, he went back to get some little jug, you know, like why? Um, and the Gemara over there explains that a tzaddik realizes that every single physical thing that's in the world has its purpose. It has, um, and the, the more we understand that this is Hashem's world, and that every single thing in this world is Hashem's, the more we understand that every single thing in the world um, is holy and it has a purpose and we have to use it um, properly. Um, and the less we understand it, the less um, the less preciousness we, we feel and the, the less we care about physical things, which seems so opposite because we might think that um, we don't have to care about physical things. We should be these holy people who don't have to worry about um, Gashmias. You know, we're just going to be spiritual. And actually, that's not a Jewish concept at all. Okay? In, in, a, in other religions, the less physical things you have, the holier you are. Um, and in Yiddishkeit, physical things are to be used for holiness. And why? Because la Hashem ha'aretz malaya, the world and everything in it belongs to Hashem, and therefore, if I've been put in this world with various things in this this world, those things need to be used in service um, in the service of Hashem. Um, Rabbi Huda says in the name of Rabbi Shmuel that a person is obligated to make brachas on everything in the world um, because it belongs to Hashem. So every time we want to eat an apple, if we are conscious of the fact that the apple really belongs to Hashem and he's letting me use it and he's giving me the opportunity to find the sanctity in this apple, then I'll immediately make a bracha. And, that, and the, the Gemara says actually that we should be making brachas on everything, not just on food. And asks like, why not? Why are we only commanded to make brachas on certain things? And answers because we wouldn't be able to live if all we had to do all day was uh, was sit, make brachas. You know? um, in fact, it says that every time we take a breath, um, we should actually be making a bracha and saying, like, thank you, Hashem, I was able to breathe. Okay, and thank you, Hashem, that I was able, like for every single thing, but then we wouldn't be able to do anything else. And so the Gemara concludes this whole discussion by saying that um, while we don't, we're not obligated to say brachas on every single thing. There are clearly certain things we've been told to make to make brachas, but that we should make ourselves aware all the time. So even when we don't have an obligatory bracha to make, we should be taking notice all the time that this belongs to Hashem and thanking Him that that He has that He's given it to us. The Gemara tells a cute story of. Um, Rab Chia Bar Abba says he was once a guest at the home of a very, very wealthy man, and they were served on a golden table, um, on golden platters, and every delicacy that you could possibly um, imagine. And in the middle of the table, there was a small child sitting, and the child was singing the words over and over again, La Hashem Ha'aretz Malah. These three words, La Hashem Ha'aretz Malah. And he obviously learned lots of different tunes to chant it. And Rabbi Chia was wondering about it. And he said, Is this your grandchild? And they're like, Who is it? Who's sitting in the middle of the table and just chanting these words, La Hashem Ha'aretz Malah. And the wealthy man said to him, um, I instituted this custom that there's always a child or somebody sitting here in the room and saying these words, La Hashem Ha'aretz Malah, because otherwise it's so easy to become arrogant as a result of my wealth and to forget that the wealth is not my wealth, but that it actually all belongs to Hashem, that every single thing that I own really belongs to Hashem. And he's just using me as a channel, as a funnel to have it, um, to have it in the world. And so I have this little child sitting here um, saying the whole day, La Hashem Ha'aretz um, um, Malah. Um, the Chazal explained to us that Hashem has a treasury filled with things um, and we have access to all of those things and our access to those things is through davening, through prayer, uh, which is davening, through, um, through saying brachas, through doing mitzvahs, that gives us access to Hashem's treasury. 
Um, and you know, some people have easier access, some people have more difficult access, but say Chazal, we all have access to Hashem's treasury. La Hashem Ha'aretz Malah, every single thing in the world um, belongs to Hashem and is like giving us the keys the, the, um, to, to try and get in, to try and get what, to try and get what we need. Um, as you said, there is a custom that we write these words, La Hashem Ha'aretz Umalah, that everything belongs to Hashem. Whenever we want to put our name in something, particularly in a book, um, that you want someone to return to you. Um, so you want everyone to know this book belongs to Rufki Chaikin, but before I write my name in the book and say, this is my book, on the top, I put the three letters, which is the acronym over here, the Lamad, the He, and the Vav of the words La Hashem Ha'aretz Umalaya. Everything belongs um, to, to Hashem. Um, I'm the keeper of it right now. <laughs> okay, Rif Rif Chaikin is, is keeping it right now. When Bachelor was a little girl, I opened one of her books one day and I saw that she wrote, this book belongs to Hashem and Bacheva Chaikin. <laughs> so, so where did you get this from? So she says, well, Lamad Hey is La Hashem, belongs to Hashem, and the Vav is And. <laughs> so this book belongs to Hashem and to Bacheva Chaikin. So I tease her about it um, till, till now. A simple explanation for, um, for this sentence, Hashem um, Haaretz Mulaya. Haaretz is talking simply about the land of Israel, says Rashi. Um, whenever you say the, the land, um, it's not just talking about the world, but it's talking about the land, the specific land of Israel. And then Tevel the Yoshveva is talking about all the rest of the world as, um, as well. If you have a look at the second puzzle, Ki hu al yamim yesada, that Hashem made it on seas, the al nahare neha, and he placed it um, by, um, by rivers. So just as a practical thing, the world was created um, but that it was all water, um, and then Hashem pushed away the waters and made um, and made dry land. Every dry land has to have some water near it. So sometimes we're a bit more landlocked or we're nearer to the sea. It says there's no land anywhere. It says in Gemara, so I guess this is the days before there were airplanes and such. There's no land that is further than 18 days walk from water. Just uh, uh, a little bit, bit of information, trivial, um, trivial pursuit, because um, place nowhere can exist without um, without water at all. So if you remember, if you go back to the beginning of um, Sefer Bereshit, the creation of the world, um, when it speaks about what the world was like before there was a created world, it says that the land was tohu vavahu, which is it was waste and empty, it was chaos, it was nothingness. Um, but then it says that the spirit of Hashem, marachefet al it was hovering on the face of the water. In other words, clearly before creation, there was a physical entity called water. Um, and I, I find that um, particularly um, fascinating. I, I always had difficulty um, with the concept of a mikveh purifying someone, because a mikveh going into water, which is a physical thing, now changes somebody's spiritual status. And it all, I always struggled in trying to understand that until um, I read this somewhere, um, that water was there before creation of the world. So water is the only actual physical thing that is spiritual, right? It is, water is a, um, actually a spiritual thing, although it presents to us as something as something physical and therefore water can change your spiritual um, your spiritual status um, okay um, continues the capital it says me Hashem, who can go up um, the mountain of Hashem umi akumbim kompacho, and who can um, stand in this holy place so at a simple level it's telling us about the place of the of the Beit Hamikdash Everywhere is, everywhere is holy, um, but the place of the Beit HaMikdash is more holy and not everybody can go there. And there are many rules that um, govern that. Um, people had to be at, um, they had to be in a state of purity. There were some places that only uh, Kohen was allowed to go to, um, like Karabait, for example. Even today, that is considered a holy place. And according to some opinions, you may not go up to Harabite, um, whether or not the Arabs let you, um, but um, and other opinions that you can. Um, people have the custom to take off their shoes when they go up there because it's more holy. And here David Amelech is already asking, he says, 
who can go up there? Practical halachic question. And who can and who can stand there? So that's one opinion of what this is, what this is talking about. A um, little bit deeper than that, it's talking about our service of Hashem. Who can go up and serve God, take on things, do more mitzvahs, be better people? Um, like between us and God, between us and other humans, me, I live a Hashem. Who can go up God's mountain, do what he wants? But a much bigger question than that is me, Yakumbim Kumpacha. Who can sustain it? Who can stand there? Okay. So being good, doing good, sometimes it's, it's difficult, but it's easier than actually sustaining that level of, um, of, what we take, of what we take on. And this is what David Amelech is saying to us. Don't start feeling all good with yourself if you've just managed the first part. That's great. You've gone up God's mountain. Um, but who can, who can sustain what they've taken on? That's the bigger question. I always think about this like a diet. It's easy to diet for a few months and lose a few kilos or a lot of kilos or whatever it is. The bigger question is who can stay thin forever? Okay, so can, who can, who can, you know, me, I love Hashem, who can go up, but me, who can, who can um, sustain this? Um, the Rebbe asks, why is it um, when it talks about service of Hashem, it says going up a mountain. And he answers, he says that um, it's not easy. Service of God is not, is not easy. So even seasoned climbers, okay, when they go up a mountain, it's an effort, right? They have to, they have to make an effort. They have to have the right, um, they have to have the right clothing. They have to have the right shoes. They have to have the right support system. Um, they, they, um, it's not it's not simple just you can't just walk up um, easily and even more so says the river that um if you're going up the mountain and you haven't got the right support and you haven't got the right um, shoes and you don't have somebody um hold, holding then you let go and you slip you slide all the way um you slide all the way down so he says me i let bahar hashem and that's why the service of god is considered like you're climbing a mountain. And then he answers. He answers his own question. He says, somebody whose hands are clean, and his heart is sincere. He hasn't said Hashem's name in vain, um, and he hasn't sworn falsely. So we're talking about somebody great, somebody who is honest, somebody who is sincere, somebody who's careful what he says, what he speaks. Um, in other words, somebody who's working on themselves. Such a person doesn't say he has to be there yet. He doesn't have to be absolutely perfect, but he has to be someone who is striving to climb the mountain, right? He is being careful. And the Radak explains, he says, if a person wants to sort himself out, there's three areas that he has to look at. He has to look at what comes out of his mouth. That's loy nasa lashav, that he that he doesn't swear for nothing or tell lies. He has to be careful what he thinks about. That's bar levav, that he's careful what's in his heart. And thirdly, um, he has to be careful what he does, what his actions are. The kihapayim has to be. Um, clean of hands. And so if a person wants to walk this mountain of Hashem, he has to watch out for his thoughts, his speech, and his and his action. Um, this concept of he hasn't sworn falsely, like why is that the, the um, thing that David Amalek says when he when he tells us um, that we um, that we climbing this mountain of Hashem. Um, and the commentaries explained to us, and it's probably a medrash that you've all heard before, that a baby in uterus learns the whole Torah. So while the baby is in its mother's stomach, it's, learn, it's busy learning the whole entire Torah. And right before it's born, it's told to swear, make a promise. And what is the promise? It says, promise that you will be righteous and not wicked. And even if the whole world tells you that you're righteous, consider yourself to be wicked. That's promise that we make right before we are born um, and we try to keep it and some people keep it and some people don't manage so well to to um, keep it and so David Amalek says who can me Aleba Harashem is somebody who is keeping that promise that he made before he was born that he will strive his whole life to be righteous to be um, to be good he then um, says what happens to that person that's okay he will bring himself blessing from Hashem, and 
kindnesses from the God who was always there to save him. Continues and says, this is a generation um, that seeks him. Seek your face, Yaakov, um, the children of Yaakov, Selah forever. Um, and immediately almost all the commentaries say, the generation right before Mashiach, the people will be looking for God. There's like no question about it. It says right before the Beit HaMikdash was built, similar kind of thing that it was a generation that was looking for God. And before Mashiach comes, we will have a generation that's looking, that's looking for God. Um, and if that's anything to go by, we have unprecedented amounts of people studying Torah, looking, um, looking for God. <laughs> okay, just, just trying to, um, to, to, find, um, to find God. Um, I'm continually fascinated um because i actually always make this comment when i learn with brides and like sometimes they're really really secular brides and i say to them i think that in in the generation we're living in now everybody wants some kind of connection with god whatever it is like some people want more some people want less but everybody wants a connection with god and immediately they all say yes okay everybody wants some kind of connection with god this is what david amelak was predicting he said Ze dar darsha. this is a generation that is seeking you that's looking for you that wants some kind of um connection that wants some kind of connection um, with you um Another opinion is that the word Dershav means the teachers. So Zed Dor, this is a generation, Dershav Mavakshe Panecha, that its leaders are helping to find your face. Um, and a lot of discussion in the Gemara, do people get the leader they deserve? In other words, like, do we get a leader who helps us if we deserve a leader who helps us or not? Um, or do or does the leader change the people? And the Gemara doesn't really come to conclusions, as we know, but um, the, the Gemara points out that both things happen. The people change their leader, and the leader changes the people. And David Amalek says that in this generation, right before Mashiach comes, um, it will be that the people are demanding more of their leaders in finding God, and the leaders are demanding more of their um, followers in finding God, in looking for God. It's interesting that the Pasuk uses the word, the, um, the word ya Yaakov, the name of us Jews as Yaakov, because generally we're not called Bnei Yaakov. No. We called Bnei Yisrael. So you know that Yaakov had two names. Um, his parents called him Yaakov. And then later on, Hashem changed his name and called him Yisrael. Um, and a lot of discussion about what's the difference between the two names, but the simple understanding of it is that Yisrael is the Mashiach name, the, the name of redemption, the more spiritual name. And the name Yaakov is the more physical name or the Gullus name, the exile name. So while we are low and we are in Gullus, we are Yaakov. Um, and when we are in um, when we are in Geula, when things are high and great and spiritual, then we are um, Yisrael. So generally, we do not refer to ourselves as Yaakov. Um, even while we are here in Gullus, we call ourselves Bnei Yisrael. Why do we call ourselves Bnei Yisrael? Because we are not a people who think that this is forever. We are actually Mashiach people who are living in Gullus at the moment. So we are Bnei Yisrael. And interestingly, if you have a look, you'll see that there's no shuls or institutions that, that are called Bnei Yaakov, right? The only thing that's got the name Yaakov is Beis Yaakov, the girls' schools, because in the Torah, women are referred to as Beis Yaakov. But you don't find a shul that's called the Bnei Yaakov shul. Um, so that's, they called, everything's called Yisrael, congregation of, congregation Israel, um, Tehillat Yisrael, um, Bnei Yisrael, Agudat Yisrael, right? All the name of, yeah, but here we are in in Gullus, right? In um, wherever it is, South Africa, England, um, America, we all are in Gullus. So why are we not calling ourselves the children of Yaakov? Because we aren't Gullus people. We are just, um, we are Geula people living in Gullus. So interestingly, that in this Pasuk over here, it calls us the children of Yaakov. Um, and what is that about? It's saying two, two things. Firstly, it's saying that in this generation where we are, um, we are Yaakov, we're still living in Galus, we are actually Yisrael people. We are 
while we could have just let ourselves be Yaakov, we actually are Yisrael, okay? We are busy looking for, we're busy looking for God. And further than that, the Rebbe explains that Yaakov got his name Yaakov from the word Akev, which means a hill. Um, and we could think that we're in such a generation where there's so much assimilation and there's so much sin and there's so many bad things going on. We are like at the bottom, the hill, the bottom of the foot of the, of what the, gloriousness of the Jews is all about. And yet, says David Amela, even when you look at the Jews and say they're like the bottom of a foot, they are like Akev, they are like Yaakov, what are those Jews doing? They're Dor Dorsha. This is a generation that's still seeking God, that's still looking for Hashem, that's still trying to, um, to have a connection with, um, with Hashem. The next two psukim um, are ones that... Um, you probably know from um, if you go to weddings with choirs and such. So Usha Arim Rashechem, raise um, your heads, O gates, the Pisra Olam, and let in um, the, the openings of the world, the Yavo Melacha covered, and the king will come in. I'm going to read the whole next two Psukim. Mize Melacha covered. Who is this? Um, God, this honorable God, Hashem is the Gibor, Hashem who is strong and mighty, Hashem Gibor Milchama, Hashem who is the um, mighty warrior. So Usharim Rashechem, lift your um, lift your gates or lift your heads, O gates, Usupitchaelam, and open up the doors of the world, the Yavamelcha covered, and let the um, God um, of glory come in. Me who is Melech covered? Who is this um, King? Hashem Tzvais who Melech covered? Zela. Hashem is the um, King. Um, he is the glorious King. Zela for, um, forever, forever and ever. So let's understand this um, at different at, the, at different levels. What was actually happening here? So historically, it um, is told. We are told a story that when Shlom HaMelech went to inaugurate the the Beit Hamikdash, okay, so the Beit Hamikdash was finished being built. And he wanted to bring the Ara and the Ark into the Kaddish Kaddash, into the Holy of Holies. And the gates of Beit HaMikdash closed and wouldn't open. And nobody could get the, the gates of the Beit HaMikdash open. And Shlomo began to daven. And he said, it says that he davened 24 different prayers and nothing helped. <laughs> the gates were not interested in opening. And he, and he was like begging them, okay, this is for the inauguration of Beis HaMikdash, um, that which we've been waiting for for all this time, and the gates didn't open and didn't open, and eventually he said, you've got to let in the glorious king, right, the gates are asking him, he says, open up gates, and the gates said, why should we open, who are we letting in, and he said, you are letting in Melech covered. you're letting in the glorious um, king, eventually the gates did open um, in the merit of David HaMelech, of King David, um, king David um, and, and that's how the gate, that, that the Beit HaMikdash was able to be um, inaugurated, so that's a simple understanding of what was happening in these psukim, Shlomo HaMelech, um, pleading with the gates to, to open. Um, a little bit deeper, um, deeper than that, it says in Megillat Eicha, and it speaks about the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, it tells how um, as the enemies approach the Beit HaMikdash, um, the gates of the temple um, sunk into the ground. So no enemy got the gates of Beit HaMikdash, they just, they just sunk straight down um, and, the, um, and no one could get them. And we have um, such a promise that at the time of Mashiach, the gates will rise up and they'll be there. Okay, that will be one of the signs of Mashiach. And this is what um, David Amalek is saying here. This is a prayer for Mashiach. So Usha Arim Rashaychem, raise up already <laughs> gates. Come up, let Mashiach be here. Oh, like raise up from the ground and, and be there. Um, and the response of the gates is, Mizeh um, Melech covered. Who, who wants to, who's giving the instruction that, um, that you should come in? And uses the words, mi ze, who is. So you know that um, the word ze, this is, always refers to the glory of God. So right after the um, crossing over of the Yamsuf, um, the, the people were able to point. And we said in our davening in the morning, ze keili van vehu, this is our God. Godliness was just obvious. And it says like even little children, could just see that there was godliness. And we, we don't have that anymore, but we know that when Mashiach comes, godly, godliness um, and God and Hashem will just be obvious. We'll all be able to point and say, 
ze, this is. So over here where it says mize, where is the ze? Okay, who is the ze? In other words, say the commentaries, you asking for Mashiach, you asking for the gates to raise up and be Mashiach already, but mize, you can't see godliness yet. You don't deserve, you don't deserve Mashiach yet. You haven't done what you need to do in order to, in order to bring Mashiach. And what's our answer? Our answer is Hashem is Zuzvegibar. Hashem is mighty, right? Hashem is someone who is helping us to fight. And what fight is he helping us? He is helping us fight the fight of the Yetzirah. And even if we don't completely deserve Mashiach yet, so Usha'arim Rashaychem, raise up um, from the ground um, and let Vayava Melech covered, let God come in, um, let Mashiach um, arrive um, and it will be through that that Mashiach will come. In other words, there are different ways that Mashiach will come. Mashiach might, may come because we deserve him. That's what we would really like. But Mashiach can also come even if we don't deserve him. If Hashem just decides the time is right, Mashiach must come, and then we will. We'll do what we need to deserve him. And so this is a prayer that we're saying, Hashem, let Mashiach come even if we possibly don't deserve Mashiach yet. Let Mashiach, um, let Mashiach come. And um, so this is the, the end of our prayer when we're speaking about the greatness of, um, of the world. We're speaking about using the world in service of Hashem. We're speaking about um, having, um, have, raising ourselves in service of Hashem. And our final request is, um, Hashem, bring Mashiach, whether or not we deserve um, Mashiach. Um, so, um, this is okay, Hashem Tzakos, who Melech covered said, Hashem is the real God who is um, who is our glorious King. Selo, we say, um, means forever, forever and, and ever. Um, and that brings us to the end of this capital. If you have any questions, you're welcome to ask them. Yeah.